The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world. In America, the rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome to Sirius XM's Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. What does it take to pull together a large collection of iconic national car brands, finding just the right synergy in each, keeping the identity of each, and scaling up to a level of profitability that some business leaders can only dream of? Does it take razor-sharp determination, sometimes in the face of nationalistic interests? Perhaps a keen eye for the product of the car brands. Definitely the mentality of a winner who has a vision others cannot see. Maybe it even just takes the discipline of a car guy, a racer, a competitor, and all wrapped up in one nice guy. Meet Carlos Tavares, the champion of ambition. How else to describe a Portuguese-born leader who was raised by an accountant father and a mother who was a teacher, but learned competition at age 14 when he discovered motor racing near his home in Lisbon? Bit by the bug, Tavares never let off the gas in many respects, climbing the corporate ladder and also making his way on the racetrack. He started his career at Renault in 1981 at the age of 23 as a test driving engineer, then worked his way up the ranks within Nissan, focusing on the product side of the business, and eventually granted the full responsibility of North and South America. Within a few years, he was well on his way, sitting side by side next to Renault-Nissan CEO Carlos Ghosn. And then it all changed. On August 15, 2013, Tavares said publicly that he wanted to become CEO at an automaker. An ambitious Tavares wanted more responsibility at Renault. However, Ghosn was only four years older and had no plans to step aside. Reportedly, Ghosn demanded that Tavares apologize to staff for the public comment. Tavares refused, and he resigned from Renault on August 29, 2013, just two weeks later. That next year, Tavares was named CEO at PSA Group and spearheaded cost-cutting measures and increased the company's market share in China, which returned Group PSA back to profitability after several years of losses. He was a French champion. He also led the PSA takeover of German brand Opel and returned it to profitability, and then instigated the merger of all mergers, PSA with Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. So in January 2021, Stellantis was born. In his first press conference, Tavares said he planned to save 5 billion euros a year in terms of investment, sharing of engines, and platforms. He also announced he wanted to relaunch the most fragile brands, which could benefit from new investments. Carlos Tavares has done all of that, and the success at Stellantis is remarkable. He is hard-charging, he's focused, and he's leading the world's sixth largest automaker with an eye on the pole position. Thinker, dreamer, racer, and leader. He's my guest today. Hello, I'm uh, Carlos Tavares, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. He's been called recently a samurai of the car industry, a tightly organized, rigorous, ascetic, stiff, and simple European boss. Carlos Tavares, welcome into the program. Welcome to Cars and Culture. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you. Is that description accurate? A samurai of the car industry. I'm not even sure I know what that means. <laughs> Neither do I, by the way, Jason. <laughs> Neither do I. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it is appropriate. Uh, um, what I would say is that I'm certainly totally passionate uh, about this industry. I've been working the automotive industry for 42 years now. So indeed, I'm passionate about the industry. I'm absolutely passionate about cars and product and technology. I've been, uh, as a point of reference, uh, being racing cars in motorsports for more than 41 years or so. Um, I'm certainly an engineer that is very focused on rigor and precision. And possibly um, I could be described as a, a competitor that is very demanding uh, on, uh, on himself and on uh, the teams uh, with, uh, with whom he's working with. So, uh, yes, uh, demanding, yes, rigorous, passionate, competitive. That's how I would describe it. Then you can translate all of this in other words. That's fine. But that <laughs> would be my description of that guy. 
A former French finance minister said, indeed, the word demanding. He also said cold, fast, and tremendous efficiency, obsessed with work. Also accurate? Well, not exactly accurate because efficiency is correct. I would say more effectiveness. Uh, you see, I always have one question coming up from all of my friends, uh, mostly when I'm in the paddock of the racetracks. Uh, people ask me, how come you can find the time to race? Uh, and the understatement is to race so often. Well, it is because I'm managing my life in a very balanced way. Uh, I believe we have uh, three major priorities in life. One is our family. The other one is our job. And the third one is our leisure. Uh, as everybody knows, my leisure is motorsports. So I balance motorsports, my wife, my kids, my grandkids and my job. And uh, when you want to balance those three priorities and protect them, um, you, you try to be efficient in everything you do, which means, yes, you need to be very efficient. If, if you are not efficient and effective, then indeed you are not going to be able to manage the balance. And if you are slow at doing things, indeed 24 hours per day will not be enough to manage the balance. So being efficient, uh, being fast in the wording of the minister that you were mentioning or quoting is part of managing the overall balance of this triangle where the three peaks are family, job and leisure. And indeed, you need to be very efficient and very fast if you want to balance the 24 hours of the day and you have to set clear decisions and clear priorities. That's what I am trying to do. So far, it has been uh, working reasonably okay. So let's see how much time we can manage that balance. <laughs> In the 42 years, have you achieved optimal efficiency with where you are right now? Do you know how to handle those three different um, aspects that you just, you just laid out? It would be arrogant uh, for me to say yes. Certainly, uh, I would answer no, mm -hmm. because it's normal. Uh, you know, if we... If we define ourselves as being competitors, um, I would like to say, and hopefully with enough humility, that um, I try to live in the world of, uh, of sports. The world of sports is to first uh, um, realize that each time I'm talking with a world champion of any discipline, the first thing that strikes you when you talk with a world champion is that that person is extremely humble. I have no example of uh, world champions who are not very humble persons. So humility is, I think, a foundation for a lot of the performance. But it also means that uh, you should never be happy with what you get. And the better it goes, the more concerned you should be. Uh, it is, it is part, of the, part of the sports world. You are always pushing the limit, always trying to go beyond what you have done yesterday to try to do better. And if we were able to create this kind of uh, spirit, sports, uh, sports team and sports mindset uh, in the team where you always try to do better what you have eventually succeeded the previous day, then of course you are never happy and you, never, you are never at the end of the, of the road of the journey. This is the kind of mindset in which I'm trying to put myself in and, of course, bring my teammates along with me on the same sports-oriented mindset, which is you are never happy with what you got, but does not mean that uh, reversely you are unhappy. You are just trying to do better, very simply. There is nothing negative about that, but it's part of the way we are. In a similar way, in a sports mindset way, you believe that the world, the automotive world, is fiercely competitive. And you have said, including just recently, earlier this year, at the Consumer Electronics Show, only the best will survive. The very Darwinist view of the automotive world. And you also said that you're here to make Stellantis successful. And that when you talk to blue-collar workers about the goals that you've set for a particular plant, for example, you say it's demanding, but if you don't meet these goals, you'll be in a vulnerable position. Only performance protects. I'm guessing that that 
sort of ethos is one that has now developed inside Stellantis over the last two years because of the the um, mindset that you've tried to bring to this, right? What you have stated, Jason, is absolutely correct, including the words that you are using. Those are exactly the, the words I'm using when I'm interacting with my people. Uh, you see, I believe that the Western world is now sick of demagogy. Uh, I think the Western world is sick of demagogy. And what is demagogy? Demagogy is all about telling the people the things they would like uh, to hear from you, to be feeling good, but don't represent necessarily the truth or the reality of the situation that they are facing. And by being demagogic, you are not helping the people to face reality. You are not even respecting them because you are not telling them the truth. And if you, if you tell the people with all the respect what the reality is, in fact, you are showing them a big deal of respect because if you tell them what the reality is, it's because somewhere you believe that they have the skills, the mental strength and the energy to turn around the situation to make it better. So it's a matter of respect and an act of trust on the ability of the people to whom you are speaking to turn around the situation and make it better. So, yes, what you said is absolutely correct. Those are the words. Uh, I believe that not only our industry is going through a Darwinian uh, period, but it is becoming more and more brutal. The brutality that is uh, falling on the back of the industry, of the automotive industry, is an amazing thing that is increasing by the day. And um, I used to say, I said this recently to the the president of my country, I, I told him, look, if um, I want you to know that I'm very uh, moved and very um, respectful of my people, because if you were to ask the societies of our countries to make 10% of the change that my employees at Stellantis are doing right now, with 10% of what we are doing right now in the company, you would put the society on fire. So uh, I think it is time for us and time for me to express my hats off, my hats off congratulations to my people for the magnitude of the change that they are executing in a time window which is so short. And 10% of what we are doing right now in the automotive industry would be enough to set the fire to the Western societies in which we are living. So this is important for us to realize. And indeed, in this kind of magnitude, at this kind of uh, speed of change, if you don't do it, you disappear because somebody else will be able to do it and, and that will be making a big difference. That's why, indeed, I believe that we are going through a Darwinian period. I believe that only performance protects. And I believe that taking the risk of saying the truth to the people, even if it is not a demagogic, demagogic way of expressing yourself, is a matter of respect and a matter of trust on their skills to improve the situation. Does the rest of the auto industry take the seriousness that you talk about or take the vision that you talk about as serious as you do? Well, I don't know. I, I think yes. Uh, I cannot, of course, I don't have so much evidence, but I have a huge respect vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis my peers. I mean, they are absolutely uh, highly resilient, well-educated, very smart thinkers, strategic people. So uh, huge respect uh, to my peers. Then what is the magnitude of change that uh, actually is really happening inside of the companies? I don't know. I can only say that it is tough uh, to compete with them. Uh, because it's tough, I suppose they are doing the right things. If they were not doing the right things, it would not be so 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 difficult. So yes, I think they are uh, great leaders doing the right things because it's difficult uh, to compete with them uh, in the marketplace. And that means that the standards of the automotive industry are very high. And this is also something that the heads of state should think about. Today, the automotive industry is not only about automobiles. Today, the automotive industry is about freedom of mobility, which is a foundation of modern democracies, as long as we keep it safe, clean and affordable. And it is also about technology. Uh, I'm surprised by the number of entities 
sometimes startups that come to us because they believe that we have the uh, engineering power and the technology power to uh, go through a certain number of, uh, of locks. So the role and mission of the automotive industry right now in the Western societies in the pulling up the technology in many, many different dimensions is absolutely, absolutely fundamental to many developments of a modern society. So from the freedom of mobility side, as much as from the technology side, the automotive industry is a very powerful engine. And I think that uh, my peers have understood that and that most probably they are doing the right things. I'm not sure that the societies in which we are operating have totally understood what they would be missing if they were to accept that the automotive industry would not anymore be a leading industry of their societies. When we talked several years ago, you were very concerned at where um, various governments around the world were positioning the automotive industry and in fact not enabling the kind of growth that needed to occur for freedom of mobility and for freedom of technology. Do you still feel the same way? Do, do, do you feel that the industry is inhibited in some way? What I feel is that we have growing and visible signs. I would like to insist on growing and visible that there is part of the political spectrum uh, in the Western world that is now going to fight against individual freedom of mobility. Uh, and this is visible. You just have to look at the, what happened at the last um, uh, forum uh, for freedom of mobility. It is quite clear that in the political spec spectrum of the Western world, we have now emerging political forces that have a mission to fight against individual freedom of mobility. And, and I think that's scary from a, from a citizenship perspective. I think that's scary and I think we should fight against that. I think we should not allow uh, our societies to drift in a direction where people are not free anymore to decide on Saturday morning that they would move with their family uh, to somewhere uh, to enjoy a nice day in the, in the, in the, in the forest or a nice day on a, on a trek. So that's important for me as a, a citizen of the free world to protect uh, the freedom of mobility, the individual freedom of mobility. I think that's important from my perspective. I also think that when you look at the number of patents, when you look at the number of uh, developments that are done in the automotive industry from a pure technological standpoint, this is absolutely outstanding. And uh, I was a, a board member of um, an aerospace uh, company a few years ago. I can tell you that the complexity that we are dealing with, the, the, the fine technology that we are now executing in the automotive industry is on the leading edge of the uh, worldwide industry, comparing all the industries of the world. And I think that's, that's very important for people to know. This, this industry is a huge technology engine of the Western world. And as everybody knows, but not everybody accepts, uh, we are competing with the rest of the world. Let's go back to what you said about brutality and the brutality of the industry. And at one point, you've actually called the industry that the industry is confronted with a succession of chaos of all kinds. What sort of chaos are you referring to? Well, mostly two kinds of chaos, um, perhaps uh, even three. But let me start with the most important. The first, the first uh, chaos is uh, uh, regulatory chaos. Uh, we see that the lead time of our industry uh, in fundamental uh, technological changes is between five and ten years. That's where the lead time is. And uh, we see that the change of direction on regulations, uh, the change on magnitude of the uh, expectations, uh, is moving uh, in a way that is disregarding, disregarding what we would call the state-of-the-art uh, technology uh, development. Uh, that's very scary, because if you disregard the reality of physics, you can push the industry to make big mistakes. The other day, I was, I was having a fantastic dialogue with a, uh, one a US senator. Don't ask me which one. Uh, but I was having a very nice conversation. And uh, I was sharing with him uh, in all, all honesty, say, look, uh, you should be careful with one thing. And I have been saying this to the European heads of state in the same way is, there is one thing that 
the parliaments cannot overrule, it is physics. Be careful. Parliaments yeah. cannot overrule physics. And if you are trying to impose uh, on the industry and on the citizens things that look nice, but you are overruling physics, then you will make big mistakes, uh, which means that uh, the brutality that we feel is coming from the fact that some uh, political uh, powers, which we respect because we are a compliant, fully compliant company, are overruling on physics. If they overrule on physics or if they overrule on the state of the art of the technology, they are going to push us to make big mistakes, which are going to be detrimental not only to the societies, but also to the countries or the regions where that will happen. So it's important that we respect the state of the art of technology development and that we don't try to overrule physics as a matter of imposing a specific view on what the society should be. But there is a time to develop, a time to validate, a time to execute, and then time to enjoy. But all of this needs to be, to a certain extent, to a certain extent, um, respected. That's one. The other one is uh, the geopolitical chaos. I mean, the way the world is going uh, uh, towards more fragmentation is certainly not going to create more wealth or more comfort to the people. I, I believe that the current fragmentation of the world is going to mean uh, more tensions, which means more risks of war. It's going to mean more inflation, which means less quality of life. Uh, in some cases, it's going to mean more shortages in some goods or materials that people would like to enjoy. So uh, I'm very, uh, I'm very concerned by the fragmentation of the world. And of course, for a global company like ours, the fragmentation of the world is something that we see every day. We see every day that there is a, one more regulation trying to put a part of the world in a bubble and then another bubble and another bubble. Well, think about the, uh, the COVID uh, vaccination. Do you think that in a, in a very fragmented world, we could have come with such a, a good uh, solution in such a short period of time that we could deploy across the world in such a fast uh, uh, forward uh, speed? So you see clearly with the vaccination on COVID that the globalization of the world was a major factor for progress and for creating the right medicine at the right pace and for deploying that medicine at the right speed. If we go the opposite way, which is fragmentation, I don't see how good things could happen for the human beings with more fragmentation. And why do we say this? Because we are a global company, so we see it happening every day. If you are living in your country uh, with a very um, uh, limited scope of business, you don't see it so much. But if you are privileged enough like me to work in a global company, you see this fragmentation coming every day. So regulatory chaos, geopolitical chaos, and of course, uh, all the scarcity management that is the consequence of COVID is demonstrating that there is now a certain number of actors and societies that enjoy the management of scarcity. The management of scarcity means a high pricing power, means comfortable businesses, uh, doesn't mean necessarily uh, more wealth, uh, more health and more comfort and more joy uh, for the citizens. So those three dimensions for me are, are um, a concern. Regulatory chaos, geopolitical chaos, and management of scarcity that will not bring a better life to the people. In North America, the conversation is all about electric vehicles. Is the regulatory chaos affecting your plans for the rollout of electric vehicles, or are you just having to adjust based on what's been put in front of you? For us, it's quite simple. Um, once we understand where uh, the, political, the political leaders want to go, we, run, we try to run faster so that uh, they cannot catch up on us. Uh, but that's, uh, that's very tough for the Stellantis people. But once we understand where we should be going, we run very fast. We, want, we don't want to be catch up by the wave of uh, constraints and, uh, and regulations. But of course, if you want to run fast to a certain uh, extent, 
uh, you need to be uh, on a rolling start uh, when the uh, regulations actually happen, which then means that you need to decide it ahead of the regulations. What does it mean? It means that we have to decide things before they happen to make sure that when they happen, we are on the rolling start and we are ahead of the wave so that we are not catch up by the wave. Uh, that means also that by designing ahead of the event and by taking some risk on what we are deciding, we can also put ourselves in trouble if we were deciding the wrong thing. Uh, and that is not going to be good uh, for the companies nor for uh, the societies in which we operate. So if our regulations do not become predictable, if our regulations are not focus on the right thing that improves the life of people, then we have a higher risk to anticipate the wrong direction ahead of the event, which is, I don't think is a good thing for any of us. So it would be better that uh, we uh, could count on a reasonably stable, a reasonably stable uh, situation. And I will give you a controversial, a controversial um, uh, example. Uh, which is not US-based, so nobody will get hurt in the US, and uh, certainly not my friends from Michigan. If you take the, the ban on ICEs that has been decided by the European Union in 2035, uh, do I like that? Not necessarily, because I think there are better solutions for the planet. But uh, at least there is one thing I cannot criticize, is the fact that the information is given to us ahead of schedule. I mean, I have to prepare, I've been preparing since at least 2020, if not before, to the ban that would happen in 2035. So there is some time to adapt. And if it is stable, then we can adapt and we can, uh, we can uh, organize our businesses in function of that. So stability on the, um, on the regulations is very important for our companies to be reshaped in a way that is consistent with what the societies want to extract from us. That's, that's okay. But if we have uh, the change in direction um, very often, and as you have seen through the e-fuel discussion in Europe, you add mm -hmm. confusion to that important change, then it creates a lot of hesitations and a lot of wasting the energy and the resources of the society. So it's important that we keep it stable. Whatever the direction we go, it's reasonably important that we keep it stable. The other thing is that if we are really sincere, about improving uh, uh, the quality of life on the planet by fighting global warming, which is our case because we'll be carbon neutral by 2038 as a corporation. If we are really sincere, uh, we should be really using the scientific power of our uh, companies in the most effective way. And that means that we should be technology neutral in the way we build the regulations. Because when you are deciding on a regulation that needs 20 years need time to create the appropriate impact, what is the probability in our world that nothing will come naturally on this direction over the next 20 years? What is the probability that for the next 20 years, while we are unfolding the EV strategy, there is another technology that may come laterally and that will challenge this direction? Of course, on a 20-year time window, the probability is high, which means the societies and the citizens of the world would be much better served with technology-neutral regulations than with one political choice of one technology supposed to be the technology that will solve all the problems. This is a risky political decision for uh, the future of the Western world. But having those kinds of reliable, reasonable solutions imply that the political systems would stay stable. And as you alluded to earlier, it's been anything but that to this exactly. point. It's very exactly. hard to chart the future if you can't have political stability at the core, correct? Absolutely agree with that. And by the way, um, from time to time, um, people misunderstand me. There is uh, one thing I'm not doing. And I want to make it very clear. I'm not criticizing the political leaders. Right. But I think that their job is absolutely becoming an impossible job because the world is moving very fast. The complexity is going through the roof. 
and people are looking for solutions, short-term solutions, on very complex problems that need a long lead time to be solved, uh, and certainly much more than one political mandate. So we are giving the political leaders a mandate of a few years to solve short-term issues that need uh, two or three mandates to be solved properly because they are very complex. And, and indeed, this is not something that we should criticize the political leaders for because they, they cannot address that. Their mandate at best is a, a two-fold mandate. Our problems need to be solved about energy, about mobility, about technology. Many times it, it takes 10 years to be solved. Look at the uh, uh, clean energy problem. Look at the uh, charging infrastructure. All of this is more than 10 years, which means on one political mandate, you cannot fix the issue. People are looking for short-term solutions, which means more demagogy, which means more communication and less reality of change. So this is a problem that we need to solve as the citizens of the free world, how to give our political leaders enough uh, room, enough direction, enough time for them to help us solve those society issues. Uh, and I think it would be unfair to criticize them for that. I think we just need to help them to give more stability to the system. Which would imply a will from um, individuals within those states to want to combine their efforts to make sure that politicians are in place to serve a mandate for a certain period of time, which would actually require a longer term view of the world. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's why fragmentation Challenge. is not... That, that's the reason why fragmentation is not a good thing. Yeah. But if we, if we look at the clean energy, the clean energy uh, challenge, um, this is very interesting. Uh, you know, in Europe, there is there's a very uh, nice contrast right now. France is saying that they will relaunch a new generation of uh, nuclear plants. And they say, well, to launch this new generation of nuclear plants, uh, which has been accepted by the European Union as being clean energy, we need 15 years, one five, 15 years. So you see 15 years is three times the mandate of uh, a French president. So you need three mandates to get things done, to reinforce the uh, clean energy production from nuclear plants in France. At the same time where you are saying this, Germany, this uh, last weekend, shut down the last two nuclear plants in Germany. And those are next to next, right? France is next to Germany, right? In a very small region called called Europe. So, how can you solve the clean energy problem, which is a twenty-year fixing problem, in this kind of situation? Energy is the core of the core of the core of the core, and being for Europe as much as for the US, if you don't solve the clean energy problem by creating enough energy and green enough on a lead time that is obviously two or three times the mandate of a given president, then the problem is not with the president. The problem is with us. Right. If, if right. we don't keep it constant, we will not get the result. And therefore, if we don't keep it constant, then we should not criticize the political leaders because they are just trying to do what they have been elected for. But we should decide to keep some of those directions constant for things to actually happen. If not, we'll have to decide that the mandate of a president is 50 years, and I don't think there is a consensus for that right now. Let me ask you about the auto industry and consolidation. And when we go back to the um, some of your accomplishments and, in fact, the being at the forefront of consolidation, we go back to 2017 with uh, not only the purchase of Opal, but then following that, the merger with Fiat Chrysler and the creation of Stellantis which, as I mentioned, is just two years old. Your former colleague, our former colleague, Sergio Marchione, talked a lot about consolidation within this industry. Do you feel that consolidation is going to continue? Well, first of all, um, we are very, uh, very proud and honored uh, to be the guys that had the opportunity to go in the direction that had been set by, uh, by Sergio. Uh, as we both know, he was absolutely right. He, he got it uh, possibly ahead of us all 
Mm -hmm. And I would like to pay tribute for that. Uh, Sergio got it. And uh, we have the privilege and the opportunity to be the ones that uh, made one step in that direction. Uh, could there be other steps? With the current organization in the world, um, I, I think it's very difficult because there is something called antitrust in the Western world, antitrust in the US, antitrust in Europe, and that antitrust is uh, preventing us from going uh, one more step in, uh, in consolidation, uh, which then means that if, uh, as an example, the Chinese the car makers become bigger and bigger and bigger, the antitrust rules of the West will prevent the West from fighting against the bigger and bigger Chinese car makers. Which again, you know, it's not, uh, it's not something that we should be criticizing. We should just find a way to change it. If we want to, if we consider that some of the Chinese car makers are going to grow to a size that would become a big risk for the Western automotive world, which I think is already the case, then we should not let antitrust rules be the reason why we cannot consolidate our Western automotive industry to fight against a, a competitor that becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, I think that would be a fair discussion to have. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure that uh, the political leaders will oppose this, but uh, the current situation of the rules is that it is very, very difficult to go to the next step of consolidation with the current antitrust rules. When you look at some other issues in the industry, affordability, you've been very public about an affordability crisis that likely exists in North America. And when the average buyer looks at average transaction prices in, in the case of US dollars now almost exceeding $50,000 per new car sold, per new vehicle sold, are you as concerned today or more concerned today than you have been in the past on affordability? And specifically as it relates to the middle class uh, purchasing power? I'm indeed very concerned. Um, I'm very concerned by the fact that if we look at what happened uh, over the last uh, 50 years, uh, I would say the quality of life of middle class people in the Western world has improved. Uh, many, many, uh, many people uh, went uh, through the poverty threshold around the world thanks to globalization. Many of those people were in China and India, but not only, which means that we have been providing uh, more wealth and more comfort to many people, uh, which uh, we are very proud of, and we should say it. So from there, uh, the affordability to achieve freedom of mobility for the middle classes is something that, uh, if it is not protected, will jeopardize the uh, foundation of modern democracies. So, Modern democracies are based on the principle that you are free to go wherever you want to go with as less restriction as possible for you to enjoy a better life. That's the principle of freedom of mobility. So if we don't protect the freedom of mobility properly, we are going to put at risk uh, our own uh, societies, uh, democratic societies and free world societies. So the affordability is a, a key success factor. If we can create uh, discriminations through money that uh, uh, we don't need, because if we were to do that, we are going to make our societies unstable. And if they become socially unstable, they will not be an example for the rest of the world that they, the rest of the world should follow uh, the free society direction that, in which we are trying to go. So, yes, affordability for the middle class is a must-have. Uh, right now, we see that it's very difficult to achieve that affordability uh, because of the uh, cost of the technology that has in, been imposed on the industry in an approach which is not technology neutral. And this is a very important factor. If, if the approach is not technology neutral, if we are imposed to use one specific technology, then uh, we are all going to use that technology, which means that uh, when we look at the cost structure, we are going to read in the price of the automobiles the cost structure of the place where they are built. 
And there are two options. Either you keep your market open because you want to keep a high level of competition to benefit uh, the, the cost of living of middle classes. And you think, well, okay, to protect, to protect the cost of living of middle classes, let, let's keep my market open so that they create a great competition between my car makers and the Chinese ones. And therefore, this competition will be at the service of the affordability for the middle classes, which is more the direction which is right now taken by Europe. That, that is perhaps a tactic that can work, but the end game of this tactic is that if you want to be competitive against the Chinese, you need to be manufacturing your cars with the same cost structure, which means in the LCC countries. Yeah. And, and that's important for us to understand. So if we keep the market open to protect the cost of living of middle classes, we have to make our cars with the same cost structure as the Chinese competitors. For Europe, that means making the EV cars outside of European LCC countries. Reversely, if we take the other direction, which is let's create a bubble, let's protect our market. If we protect our market, then in that case, our ability to face those competitors outside of our protected market is nil. So we just give up on the rest of the world. And if we create a bubble, we are of course going to create the sense of scarcity, which then means inflation, which means yes, you can protect your car makers in your, your market, but at the end of the day, you will have a higher price because you will have at one point in time to manage scarcity either because there are not enough cars or there is not enough raw materials or there's not enough refining or there is not enough of this or that. So the fragmentation with the bubbles is a trap on inflation and the open market uh, is a trap on the fact that you need to align your cost structure with the cost structure of your competitors. So it's a very difficult exercise. But when I talk to, to the heads of say, say, look, I prefer competition. Uh, I will not win all the battles, but uh, I prefer to be exposed to competition because then I will have to become a better company to be able to beat uh, my competitors. And if they are very harsh, if they are very competitive, then I will have to speed up my own progress to protect uh, my company and my people from that competition. That's our position. So we go from the competition that's in the boardroom to the competition on the track. And in the final few minutes, I want to ask you, about your racing. Somebody said that he's a real race car driver who knows the difference between a titanium bolt and an aluminum bolt. He can turn down an appointment with a head of state because he has a race scheduled that day. Are both things That's true? true? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yes, but on my racing cars, uh, as most of them are currently historic, there are not so many uh, titanium bolts, but uh, the second statement is absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> Why do you race? What, do you, what is it that you love about racing? Well, it's thrilling. Uh, you know, what is, um, what is thrilling is that um, you are on the limits. You are always on the limits. Uh, if you race on, on racetracks with the sprint races, you are always 100% from the first corner to the last corner. So you are on the limits, it's thrilling. Secondly, it's teamwork. I love to work with my mechanics to try to improve the setup, improve the car, make it lighter, make it stiffer, make it more aerodynamic. Uh, I love it. So it's technically speaking, very rewarding. And um, when you are, like I was a couple of weeks ago, I was rec racing in the in the Le Castellet racetrack in the southeast of France on the, the European Formula 3, historic Formula 3 championship, a very competitive championship. And uh, we had 34 cars on the grid, the best Brits, the best Germans, the best French, the best Belgians, the best Spaniards. Um, so it was very, very competitive. And despite the fact that I could improve my best lap time with that car on that track, I was in the mid of the grid. I can tell you, when you start the race, 34 cars on the grid, uh, same Formula 3 single-seaters, and you reach the first corner, and you are P15 on the, on the grid, I can tell you, there is a lot of people on the first corner. 
You have 14 <laughs> guys ahead of you, and you have uh, 19 guys or whatever, behind 14 you. guys pushing on your back. So that's a very exciting moment where you need to manage your stress. Now, I think it's a learning experience. Uh, and every, every new race is uh, 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 an opportunity to concentrate better, to be a better driver, to manage your stress, to keep your self-control and to just push on your limits and to improve your lap times. And sometimes I just, uh, when I take, the, when I take the, the, the next race and there is some stress because you are in the middle of a very competitive pack, I put my focus on, okay, I'm, I'm starting this race first to improve my lap times. So I want to improve my lap times. And I start by that, which brings me much, much more calm and focus on what matters. How often do you race? 12 to 15 weekends per year. Okay. All right. So this is more than just a hobby. <laughs> well, if I, if I was talented enough, I would have preferred to be a professional race driver, but I was not talented enough, unfortunately. That was 42 years ago. <laughs> you also have um, a vintage garage, a, a garage that specializes in the restoration of old cars. You attract all kinds of buyers from all over Europe, right? That's correct. I have a, a very, very small um, classic car restoration company, the north of Portugal, with, a, with three people uh, working in the shop. And uh, yes, we are restoring, um, let's say, four or five cars per year mostly from the 70s, many Maseratis, Porsches, Jaguars, uh, Aston Martins, you name it. Um, so we, we restore very nice cars from the 70s. Some of them are coming from California because, as we know, in California, there is a very limited amount of rust. And that's very good for the, uh, uh, for the cars that are bought by the people who are um, uh, bought, buying those cars. And some of them come to my shop for restoration. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, work where you can see how the technology has evolved. I like and love to work with my craftsmen because they are absolutely uh, great artists in the things they do. And um, it, it's a very rewarding activity. Of course, it's not a, a big profit activity. Actually, I think it is slightly red, but that doesn't matter. It's, it's all about the passion for automobiles. Final thing, Carlos, um, you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, 40, 41, 42 years that you've been in the industry. When you were asked by the French newspaper, are you untouchable? You, it was certainly as long as you deliver, but you also said that you have a huge advantage. Your career's behind you. Your mandate ends in 2026. What are you going to do after that? Well, that's, that's not a problem at all, um, Jason. Uh, I have been preparing for my next life for a few years. Uh, people may not know it, but beyond what you have uh, already mentioned on the um, classic car restoration small company that I can take care of in a more intimate way and certainly with some other perspectives to grow. Um, I'm also having a notable uh, business uh, in Portugal. You know, Portugal is a big place uh, and a nice place to spend some vacations. Uh, the tourism activity in Portugal is 15% of GDP, so there is a huge uh, tourist uh, potential in this country. I have a small chain of small uh, boutique hotels, and that also deserves attention and uh, has a big potential to grow. And last but not least, I'm a winemaker. I'm a Porto winemaker with uh, several uh, farms in the north of the country that uh, represent also for me uh, big, uh, big uh, points of uh, focus. That's for what I've been preparing, but being a Portuguese citizen of a country that nobody knows where it is on the map, uh, 10 million, <laughs> a 10 million people country, uh, I understand that uh, I have the opportunity in this country to help uh, in other manners, uh, if that uh, is uh, uh, the opportunity. But uh, for the time being, I don't think I have any problem with my uh, retirement. I think I will be uh, very, very busy, and that's fine because uh, we, you need to change and you need to take into consideration time. The time is moving by, and as we both know, the only thing that is counted is time. So let's enjoy time. Now, finally, a samurai of the car industry becomes a samurai of the tourism industry for Portugal, perhaps. <laughs> Carlos, 
<laughs> Carlos Tavares, what a pleasure to be with you on Cars and Culture. Thank you for sharing your view with the North American and global audience. I very much appreciate being with you again. Thank you, Jason. It was my big pleasure, as always, to discuss with you and with the audience. Thank you for uh, hosting me and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks again to my guest today, Stellantis CEO, Carlos Tavares. And to see my interview with Carlos, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to see nearly 100 interviews. And thanks for listening to Cars and Culture. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as on Instagram, at Cars and Culture SXM, and on Twitter, at Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. We'll see you down the road.